Learning from Adult Role Models Who Are Deaf or Hard of Hearing, presented by Outreach Programs at the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. The CSDB logo is displayed with the tagline, Learning, Thriving, Leading. Our presenter, Kim, is standing in front of a wall in a university classroom. She is communicating in sign language with voice narration. Captions are below on screen. Title, Kim. Hi, my name is Kim Para. I was born deaf. My parents found out I was deaf at roughly nine months of age because my older brother, you know, they thought I was acting different than him. He could respond to noises and so forth, yet I was sitting very quietly. So my parents suspected that something was wrong. So what they did is take some pans and bang them behind me. And again, I did not respond. So my brother, my mother brought me in to the doctor's office and found out that I was deaf. When they found out that I was deaf, the doctor said there were so many different options, such as I could learn sign. Um, and my parents decided to go ahead and choose that sign for me, and I have been ever since I was young. I was in the mainstream setting in an elementary and middle school deaf and hard of hearing program. But I was in regular classes, regular ed classes, all my core classes with an interpreter, such as math, English, reading. But it was really nice that they had a deaf and hard of hearing program, because like during lunch or after school, I still could socialize with my peers. And so that was very nice. When I was in high school and college, I was the only deaf individual during that period of time. And it, in high school, it was really good that I learned how to utilize an interpreter um, during my elementary and middle school years. So when I got into high school, I knew exactly how to advocate for myself. So I would say, oh, that interpreter doesn't really fit me. Can we have a different interpreter? And then when I got into college, the same thing took place. I went to the University of Denver and majored in criminology. Criminology. Went through college. Well, before I graduated, I had an internship. Luckily, I got the opportunity at two different sites. One was at a hearing agency and another at a deaf agency. At the hearing agency, it was with the sheriff's office. So I had an interpreter present with me. So I would interview the inmates. After that, I went to an inter internship at Dove, Deaf Overcoming Violence Through Empowerment. And that agency is specifically for deaf individuals who have experienced abuse, with domestic violence or sexual assault. So in that environment, all the people there sign. So it was amazing comparison between the two different internship sites. Once I completed my internship, uh, Dove offered me a job and now I've been working for them for the last 10 years. It was nice that I had that balance. So I would go to work with deaf individuals and then go home. And I do have hearing individuals in my family, but we do sign at home as well. So my upbringing, my parents were very much advocating for me and respectful in elementary and middle school. I did wear hearing aids with utilizing an interpreter. I did also attend speech therapy in high school, uh, it was nice to be free. And that's where I tried to find my identity. I felt as though the hearing aids were not really benefiting me. So I decided not to use them anymore and only communicated through sign and an interpreter throughout the rest of my time. And it really helped me during my upbringing because my parents signed at home. 
so they could communicate with me. So whenever we went to different locations, they would tell me what all the stuff was and truly increased my vocabulary. And my parents truly encouraged me to go to different deaf events and participate, such as an Aspen camp throughout my years and youth leadership camp, YLC. I also went to deaf youth program that happened every Friday. So I was able to socialize with other deaf kids from different schools. So all the mainstream deaf kids would come to a rec center and be able to socialize together. So that was a huge benefit. And one thing that I truly wish my parents did while they were raising me was to, you know, often um, at different family events, there's so many people around that my parents would say, oh, hold on a second, and continue talking with the other hearing family members, and then come back and tell me what was going on. So I felt as like, oh, I felt like I was the last person to know anything that was taking place. So I wish that we could say maybe there was an interpreter there or people with SimCom signing and talking at the same time so I could participate in the conversation that I really wanted to. Title, Challenges Growing Up. One challenge that I faced while I was growing up was, of course, I was mainstream, so I depended a lot on the interpreter for everything and all the information that was taking place, either in school or what the students were saying and what have you. So sometimes I do feel as though I was the last person to know what was taking place. But again, I didn't allow that to stop me. I didn't just sit back. You know, I still participated in like the volleyball team, with all the other hearing students. I did have an interpreter come to all of the practices and games. And I also even joined the cheerleading team. And that was a huge impact because many people were saying, wow, they chose the one deaf individual out of all of us, all of the hearing students that could listen to the music and me being deaf, I was unable to hear the music, but I was able to follow all their movements and continue practicing. So I did that for a year, and after that, I decided that was enough. Title, Advice for Parents. My advice for the parents is that when you find out your child is deaf, deaf or hard of hearing, and I understand you're going to go through the grieving process. That's normal. But just keep in mind that it's not about you, that it's about them and them as an individual. So if the child, um, while they're growing up, you know they go through phases and trying to find their own identity. So maybe they, the child says, I want to talk more. Sure. If they want to sign more, sure. Allow them that and to be able to figure out who they are. If this child des decides, I don't want to use my hearing aids or my cochlear anymore, or whatever devices they have, allow them to do that. Um, you shouldn't force them to match the mainstream society, because again, it's about the child and what they're comfortable with. Again, it's very important to communicate with your deaf child. So check in with them. Ask them questions. How are you feeling today? How are you feeling about your hearing aid or your cochlear? Is it working for you? Just ask them. Or if they possibly want to remove the device and experiment and see what is successful for the child. Because that truly helped me when my parents respected me and my decision in high school to not wear my hearing aids anymore. I just felt as though it wasn't a benefit for me. My parents said, okay, at that time, and whatever works for you. The most important attitude and skill that helped me while I was growing up is, well, I want to tell you that, you know, regards to the devices, 
it's not what helps your child succeed. What helps them is their internal motivation and wanting to become successful. It doesn't matter what their mode of communication is. If they are oral, if they can speak, if it doesn't really matter. It's their internal motivation that makes them succeed. It's not one device that will specifically help that person succeed more than others. Because just like me, I do not wear hearing aids anymore. I work at a deaf organization and very successful. I'm happy where I am. Title, Understanding Deaf Culture. So what I would like people to understand about individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing is, you know, we have our own culture. It's just like other groups. You know, deafness is not a medical issue that needs to be fixed. It's just a culture where you can learn the language and learn the culture of deaf culture. And we're just like anyone else that's hearing. It's just we can't hear. And I know every deaf individual is different in terms of in terms of educational background, intelligence, what have you. But that's the same as hearing individuals. And so what I mean by deaf culture is deaf culture has its own norms, values. In regards to norms, let's say we run into another deaf individual, we'll immediately hug and say hi. And we even have our own values, which means there's storytelling. We tend to gather together for numerous events. And we have to tap each other on the shoulder to get attention. Sometimes we'll flash the lights or bang on things. <laughs> the one thing that we don't have that other ethnic groups do is we don't have our own food. <laughs> so... But deaf culture and also ASL has its own grammatical structure and syntax. So just like you learn any other new culture you try to incorporate into their world as a child. Title, Assistive Devices. So nowadays we have so many different tools and devices that even help me get through in my professional life. <laughs> Just like oh, a long time ago, we would use a TTY. I even had one at home. And I would stay up late at night talking with my friends, taking turns on typing our conversation. So I attended numerous deaf events and different clubs and was able to socialize with a wide range of deaf in individuals. So I was able to see uh, a wide range of forms of communication to be able to use um, possible more English ways. Some would use a mixture and some were very ASL. So that wide spectrum. And I had that exposure. And now we have video phones, which is so awesome. And I can actually see the person and be able to use sign to communicate. So I don't have, no longer have to use written language and type it. Instead, I can use sign, either point to point. If I'm talking with another deaf individual directly, I can use sign language. I have direct eye contact and notice the facial expression, so important to the language, which is really nice with the video phones, that I can see that. You know, on the TTY, you were unable to detect if they were mad or upset or what have you. It, that was very difficult because on the TTY, it was all text. Now with the video phone, you can see their mannerisms. And, you know, as a working professional, uh, and I advocate for individuals that are deaf who have experienced abuse, often the person will come into the office and want to make a report to the police station. So I have to call over to the police station, inform them that I have a deaf client here that would like to report 
and the video phone is essential. Because back with the TTY, hearing people would mistake it and hang up. They thought it was sales calls and immediately hang up. And it was such a slow, time-consuming process. But now with the video phone, I feel alive and it's a, it's, it's a great conversation. So that's very helpful, even when ordering pizza. And just like I explained, the point to point with the video phone. But also now there's video relay service, which is called VRS. So that means that I call the VRS and there is an interpreter that I can see on the screen. And that interpreter will call over to the police department, to the courthouse, wherever my client needs them to call. And even just little things like ordering pizza. They'll do that for us as well. So we can use the video relay service, which is super nice. I mean, technology continues to become better and better. And even now we have our smartphones to be able to have FaceTime and video phone conversation on ourselves. So many people are using Tango or Skype to be able to have conversations. So now it feels like we're, trying, we're catching up with hearing people. Learning from adult role models who are deaf or hard of hearing has been a production of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, 33 North Institute Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80903, 719-578-2100, www.csdb.org. Special thanks to Regis University for the use of the Denver Tech Center campus as a filming location. Videography by Deb Branch and Sean Levier, copyright 2014. Audio description, Jim Olson, editing assistance, Diane Kevington, Dr. Laura Douglas, captioning, Neil Anthony Thomas, Corey McCormick, transcription, Eleanor Vasquez.